part of this informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. Today is Tuesday, September 4th. Welcome everyone to Carnegie Town Hall. Those of you here in the audience, those of you on watching live on CityLink or on SiouxFalls.org, welcome. I hope it was a good weekend. I'm going to start this afternoon with a report from the Land Use Committee meeting held on August 21st. Councilor Rolfing. Thank you very much. Yes, we had a um, very good Land Use Committee meeting. And uh, you've caught me a little off guard here. I did not uh, remember that uh, or did not prepare for that. However, I uh, remember we did, uh, we did talk a little bit about, um, oh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass, I guess, at this point. I could look okay. it up. But, uh, well, wait a minute. I can look it up. Yeah, we should have minutes there. I do have my notes. Council Madam Agilor. Chair, I believe we did have a report on it at our yeah, last well. information. I reported on it last week. I think week. that's right. That's right. Thank the you. The clerks are just after that's Council Rolfing, apparently. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that on the on the agenda when I read it ahead of time, and I otherwise I would have been prepared. But uh, well, it's fine. We'll just make a note. Thanks for putting me on the spot, but sorry, we'll I'm, we'll get I'm back. Just reading in. the script. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Rolfing, especially as you recover from surgery. We appreciate that you're here today. So I'm going to move to um, Council open discussion. Do we have anything from Council members? Councillor Karski. Uh, yes, immediately following our informational meeting, we'll have our fiscal committee meeting today. And um, two, two items on the um, agenda. Uh, our headline speaker for both will be Mr. Rich Oaksel. So we, it should be an interesting discussion, both on fraud control policy and our citywide fees, including the park department fees and how we're going to publish them and um, justify them, I guess, to some extent. So that'll be immediately following our informational. Great. Thank you, Council Kresge. Any questions for Council Kresge? Other open discussion this afternoon? Yes, Council Jameson. I would just throw it out as an idea. The, uh, you know, we had just a recent water restriction uh, initiated and uh, another measure to conserve water. And it just seems like maybe a good approach to review that whole policy uh, based on the now the existence of Lewis and Clark. You know, we'd certainly made those decisions to restrict water use prior to the addition of Lewis and Clark. So maybe our rationale and our decisions for making those restrictions could be changed or should be changed, or certainly modified now that we've got a new source of water. <clears throat> whether they're, uh, you know, it's not about conserving or whether we should or shouldn't conserve water, but more so review that approach to how we restrict water use when we have a new source. Well, and the trigger now is the Big Sioux River being at a certain level, but that was prior to Lewis and Clark being a source. So would you like that to be an informational item? Would you like it to go to a committee? What are you, what are you thinking? I just thought I'd bring it up, but I think it would be informative for us to probably, and I could share that easily with Public Works, and they could maybe think about it or tell us that, in fact, they have made changes. But uh, I had a couple of calls from people uh, about that watering restriction new regulation and and had we thought about Lewis and Clark and its involvement and I said I'm not sure so mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm not right there being able to answer those questions so perhaps the rest of us need help too so either way I just thought I'd bring it up Councillor Karski and then <clears throat> I'm gonna agree with Councillor Jamison um, as of last or I'm sorry last month I guess with the new Lewis and Clark project we do have a very good source of water and at, like Councillor Jamison, we were at the uh, ribbon cutting for that event a couple of weeks ago. And at that meeting, um, former Mayor Hansen spoke and he talked about his first day in office back in, I think, 1988 as the Utilities Commissioner, how he was told we're out of water and it was to the point where he, he was one phone call away from calling Morels and telling him they could not use any more water. Times have changed, and thankfully we do have Lewis and Clark, and it is a very, very recent development. But I guess I too would like to hear from Public Works, and you know what is it, you know, on our source, our usage. You know, we don't want to ever be in a situation where we have to call our our largest industrial users users of water and tell them they can't turn on the faucet anymore. But I guess I would like to hear about that, and maybe it is a good policy thing to look at. Councilor Rolfing. 
That's um, exactly one of the things that I've been in the back, not in the back of my mind, but I've asked a couple of times and no one, all, the only answer I get is uh, we're okay, we're okay. And that's what our next step is after, after Lewis and Clark. You know, we've got this beautiful <clears throat> source of water coming in that should, everybody says should take us to 2050. Well, 2050 is not very far away. And uh, we planned Lewis and Clark for how many years now? He said uh, 25 years ago is Gary Hansen. They, they started working on that and knowing that they were in trouble. Um, that's only 15 years longer than what we've got right now, than what we started with with uh, Lewis and Clark. Um, and I'd like to have, uh, have a look at what we're looking at or what we're planning on for 2050. Okay. Uh, for a water source, for our next large source of water. Okay. With council's permission, I'll just go ahead and contact Public Works and have them schedule a. We'll start with an informational session. We can just kind of bounce these ideas back and forth with them, and and maybe kind of go from there in terms of possible tweaks to the ordinance or whatever might need to happen. Okay. Good. Good conversation. Other comments on that topic. Other topics for open discussion. Well, okay then, we're gonna zoom through this, this is good. We'll start with our presentations, Sioux Area Metro. I'll invite uh, Sam Trebelcock to come forward. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Much better. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Um, I w before I get started with the route analysis, um, at one of our budget meetings, and that was Council Anderson that had asked that um, it's been a while now since our um, general manager, Karen Walton, had left. And we do have a, a new general manager on board at Sioux Area Metro. His name is Eric Meyerson. He comes to us from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, he's been a first transit employee for a number of years. Thought it was important, good time to um, have you get to know him a little bit. So I was going to ask him to come up for a couple minutes and tell him a little about your, himself and how uh, things uh, he views things here in Sioux Falls. So Eric, good. Thank you, Sam. Welcome. Thank you. Um, as um, Sam mentioned I've uh, worked for First Transit for over 30 years now in the roles of uh, transit manager, service planner, and consultant. Um, my most recent position um, was uh, as the manager of the Albuquerque Safe Ride, um, which um, was a statewide um, Medicaid transportation provider. And our region served um, all of northern New Mexico, which included the cities of Santa Fe, uh, Santa, uh, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and Taos. Um, prior to work in uh, New Mexico, uh, I spent seven years uh, with the Central Arkansas Transit Authority in uh, Little Rock, where I served as a transportation planner. Um, during that period, we opened a four miles uh, streetcar line that connected the cities of uh, Little Rock and North Little Rock. Um, another major project when I was in Little Rock, we um, consolidated our express routes, uh, which enabled us to dramatically increase frequencies um, without um, requiring additional resources. Um, it also in, uh, resulted in a lot of uh, good ridership increase. I'm a big advocate of public transportation. I'm a regular transit rider. Uh, my transportation goals would include uh, frequent, direct, and competitive um, transit service. Um, that's connected to a network of complete streets. And a complete street would be one that serves the needs of uh, transit users, pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists. I'm very pleased to be in Sioux Falls with your uh, really first-rate park network and um, your increasingly energized downtown, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome to Sioux Falls. We're glad to have you. Thank you, Eric. Um, the route analysis that we have for you today is something that um, we've been working on for this entire year. Uh, we've had a number of different public involvement opportunities um, during the course of this project. Uh, URS Corporation out of Omaha was chosen as the consultant. Uh, one of the things that you might remember when we first started this study 
is this was kind of thought of as the grid study uh, to, to study whether or not a, a grid route system would work here in Sioux Falls. As we went through this process, it's something that we found um, might not work as well, and, and Bill's going to, um, from URS Corporation, is going to expound upon that in a moment. So we kind of expanded the, the, the analysis a little bit to look at ways that we could create efficiencies in the, in the system and in other methods. So that, thus is uh, the transit route analysis. So I'd like to have uh, Bill Trill from URS Corporation come up and provide the presentation and, and have him go through that. We'll take questions afterwards. Good evening. My name is Bill Tro, and I'm a transportation planner with the URS Corporation. And as, as Sam had talked about, that uh, I wanted to make a presentation to you about the, the findings, essentially, of the, the route analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam also had, had talked a little bit about what the goals of the study were when we started. And, and those were essentially to, to look at the opportunity of whether or not a grid system mm -hmm. in Sioux Falls has the opportunity to improve the efficiency with which we, we provide transit service. And then if we were able to find uh, that, that the grid system was more efficient, well, what are the most logical, what are the most cost-effective uses of that additional mm -hmm. revenue, essentially, that we would find? Mm -hmm. And in this case, when we talk about revenue, we would be talking about the opportunity for more route miles, more, more hours of service, that I think that if you, you look back at the previous transit and transportation projects that have been done, when it comes to talking about transit, the most things that people talk about we need more of is more hours into the evening, uh, more Sunday service or Sunday service at all, um, and more frequency. So those are, are things that we were looking at as as opportunities then that if we were able to find uh, more efficiency out of the out of the grid system relative to the hub and spoke we have um, and then we also looked at at this study as an opportunity to look at well really where do we need to be going in the future with with transit within the region um, and also looking at the, are there opportunities to use or, or to make changes to the fixed route service that would improve um, the connectivity of fixed route relative to where paratransit riders are coming from and going to? And if we could um, provide a, a uh, modification of the fixed route service, is there the opportunity to migrate some uh, paratransit riders at a $25 a trip cost to a fixed route trip at a $5 a trip cost. It doesn't take long to do the math there. Um, so those are the things that we were looking at. And on the bottom of this slide, there is one of the key assumptions is that we were, we were always looking at that our budget is fixed, that this isn't a, a study to say, well, OK, we could make a grid system work if we added this and this and this and this, um, if we needed to do that. So we were working with that assumption that is we had a, a fixed cost. Um, or a fixed budget to our, our service. So that would be the same hours, same miles of service that we have to provide. Um, how do we go about looking at the, the grid system review? We essentially went in and, and broke, every, broke a trip into the various parts that there are to a trip. How do I get to a stop? Um, how long do I have to wait at the stop? And that was a very critical element. Um, and what is my, my, my trip or the line haul portion of my, my trip? How is that different? Um, how, how do I transfer? Do I have to make more transfers as I make my trip? And, and then how do I get from my stop, my, de my stop to my actual destination, or essentially how far would I have to walk? Because our assumption is, is that the, the vast majority, if not all, uh, transit users are essentially walking to the bus stop, walking away, that there, there really aren't all that many park and ride um, kiss and ride trips that are being made within the, the region. When you're looking at the differences between the, the two concepts that we were looking at, the hub and the spoke, hub and spoke, which we're saying that we have in the region today, relative to the grid system, there are a few different or characteristics that make the two different or help describe the differences between the two. Um, I just want to hit on a couple of these, and, and the first one there is, is where I transfer. 
that today the vast majority of the transfers that are made on the system are either made at the Southwest Transit Center or they're made at the bus stop in downtown. With the grid system, which is essentially as it says, it's laid out more in a grid, the vast majority of the transfers are made on the street. So it would be at the corner of, of Minnesota and 18th, not at the downtown bus stop. Um, and, and this assumption is, is very critical in the overall concept because uh, with the grid system and the reliance on uh, transfers on the street, we, we, the, the ability to bring together conveniently more than two transit lines gets to be a little bit difficult when you're thinking that I need to time out the number two to get to that intersection at about the same time as the number eight because I don't want to make people wait 20 minutes, 30 minutes um, between trips and that, okay, if you had two routes, it's not that big of a deal to make them come together, but as we go three routes, four routes, up to the 12 routes that we have, it gets to be very complex in making those, those buses be able to, to transfer without a whole lot of, of wait time. Um, the next one is the frequency between buses that right now again is where we, we do the vast majority of our transferring at the bus stop and at the Southwest Transit Center. You know, we can again bring them all in at essentially the same time. Everybody gets to transfer between their buses and then they pulse back out. And I had already talked about that a little bit with the grid system, but that's much, much more complex. Um, and that the big thing there when we're coming down to frequency is that we can bring those buses together at the downtown transit center and at the southwest transit center on the hub and spoke even with the 30 minute and 60 minute frequency that we have. But when you're sitting there with working with 30 minute and 60 minute frequency and you need to do your transfers on the street, people are required to wait a long time. And in a planning study like this, we make the assumption that the average wait time at a transfer spot with a grid system or any system like this would be about half of the frequency. So in the peak period when we're running a 30 minute frequency, we make the assumption that most people are gonna have to wait or about on average, I guess, people are gonna have to wait 15 minutes to get from this bus route to that bus route. That's a while. But then when you go into the off peak, you assume with a 60 minute frequency that you're waiting a half an hour and that's on average. So you can see there with the lack of, or the, the limited frequency that we have with the bus system, that is really the, the controller as to whether or not the grid system is gonna be more efficient than the existing hub and spoke because there is a lot of, of wait time, especially if you think, well, geez, maybe I have to take three buses to get from my origin to my destination. And if it's off peak, we're making the assumption that you're gonna be waiting about 90 minutes, just waiting, not line haul, but waiting. And that just, that, that you, it doesn't take long to figure out that that's just not gonna work. Um, and typically when we're looking at grid systems, you're looking at a frequency closer to that five minutes to 10 minutes, um, as opposed to the 30 minutes and 60 minutes that we have here. So then the question always comes up, well, what would it take from a budget standpoint to go from 30 minutes to 10 minutes? Well, you'd have to triple the, the transit budget to be able to do that, to build up the number of buses, the drivers, to get that frequency down, and that's a substantial investment. Um, may, the, I, as we were going through the public engagement process, we tried to come up with some ways of characterizing some of the differences between the, the hub and spoke and the, the grid system. And, and this is a, a characterization that I had come up with that, that this is essentially our, our hub and spoke system and, and this is just anywhere USA is. In this case, we would have three transit centers and then each of the colored routes here are our are, 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 are bus routes and then the, the, the lighter colored bands are our walk distance. So you can, and the, the purpose of this is to say, is to show you what kind of coverage of our city that we could get, where might we have some gaps relative to a, a fixed budget in a, in a transit system. Now if we go to a, a hub and, or, a, or a grid system, making the assumption that we have the same route miles, the same hours of service, this is a characterization of what kind of coverage we can get. You can see that, that our, our area of coverage is more compact or less than we had under the, the, grid, the hub and spoke system. 
Um, and um, primarily the reason for that is that along each of these nor east, west, north, south grids, we assume we have service back and forth, whereas in the, the hub and spoke, we're doing a lot more um, driving through neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, I don't want to use the word wandering around, but you, you are being more circuitous because you're just trying to provide um, a little bit of service in a lot in a lot of areas and, and essentially the bottom line is, is with the hub and spoke if we have a relatively small glob of peanut butter we can spread it on a lot thinner than we can with the grid system okay so our you know we had, we had went through and looked at a number of different ideas and and essentially the bottom lines are is that when we're looking at walk distance which is very important in a northern climate is that for the most part, under the grid system, our walk distances um, increased relative to the hub and spoke. Um, some people had very good, very, very greatly improved service if they were right along a line, but um, that is, again, more concentrated along a particular corridor. Um, and we had fewer people that had uh, that quarter mile walk distance was, was convenient for them. Um, and we had a lot more wait time for transfers, even assuming the same number of transfers on the street. Um, and so that that was, and, and essentially our conclusion was, is that we don't have the frequency in Sioux Falls or the route miles in Sioux Falls to make a grid system work. It's a good idea um, in, in areas where we have a lot more frequency than we have here. So that was, essentially the conclusion of, of that portion of the study. But then we also went in and said, okay, where as we're looking to the future um, of, of Sioux Falls, do we need to be thinking about uh, providing transit service? And kind of the, the ideas or the, the rules, or the things we were looking at as we went through this process were, were first is that there are areas already within the city limits already with development at densities that are consistent to areas where that have service that do not have any transit service within the region. Essentially, outside the 229 um, corridor or the, 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 the corridor of 229 to the south and to the east. Um, but then we also have a lot of development areas that are being anticipated that are gonna have the same density or relatively consistent density that we have, again, in areas of the city that have transit service. So how do those come into play as we're looking towards the future? Um, and then we were also looking at, are there opportunities to make changes to the existing route structure to um, better serve or to provide some more um, consolidation so that we can again free up some route miles to, to extend into those areas that don't have service today. Um, and when we're looking at where growth is anticipated in the future, and that's what the map here shows, is the density of household development into the future. Um, and that you can see along the, the, the donut that's outside essentially the city limits is that those areas that are, are in red are the highest density, and then it works, it's all, all the way back down to the blues and to the no color where the lowest density developments are. Um, anticipated into the future. So you can see that in the core of the, of the city, we're still anticipating redevelopment, continued development, densification. Um, but then when we look to the, to the new development areas, a lot of that's to the east, south and east of, of 229, and again, pockets to the, to the west, south of, of 12th Street, and then even pockets to the, to the northwest off of Russell and such. So these are areas that we were, that, that if you were to be looking at where you would want to provide service in the future, those that have the most density in, in, in uh, households or essentially population would be those areas that you would look to serve. But we also look at it from the employment side. Um, and that again here you're looking at the density of new employment within the region. Um, and you can see that, that down at that, uh, 229-29 uh, systems interchange and that area down in there is where we're anticipating the significant density of, of new employment opportunities. 
um, in, even in the downtown, more employment opportunities. But then the interesting part here that I also see is in that residential um, map where I was showing moderate density to the south and to the east, we're also showing moderate density of employment. So they're op the, kind of the, that double whammy of opportun opportunity there of both employment and housing. So th these maps help drive and direct us to areas where, we'd be, where we should be considering uh, transit in the future if we were to be expanding. Um, and that essentially that this map here shows areas where we would we would be considering expanding transit into as we continue to de develop and mature as a city. Um, but you can also see here is that we've added some transit centers and the ones in the dark blue are areas where we're saying we need we should be providing service as we move into the future in those areas that have relatively little service today or no service today. Um, but the, one of the keys here we wanted to point out is that we're also looking at the idea of more transit centers. And part of the reason behind those is that if you start to think that downtown Sioux Falls is going to be that employment hub for a long time. But most of those areas that we'd be looking at expanding service to grab the residential side, those are on the outside of the donut. And if, and if a lot of those trips still want to go downtown, they're getting to be very, very long. And, and that if, if we're, and, and most of those, the, the, the distance associated with those trips is through an area that already has transit service today. So you'd be either developing these express routes to take you downtown and have a lot of duplication in your mileage inside the core, um, or you would be looking at more transfers inside the core of the city. So here what we were looking at is adding some transit centers so that you could have essentially circulators in those residential areas on the outskirts of town coming into a transit center and then you could have essentially express service to the downtown, express service between the west side and the east side uh, in the various transit centers to try to improve the efficiency. That I think is one of the, the keys that we were looking at as we move to the future. We had developed kind of an idea of, of new transit routes and this was essentially just to give us an idea of how many more miles would we need um, to to provide service to these expansion areas that we were talking about so essentially we could come up with at least a ballpark cost of, of what does it mean because there's one thing of coming in and saying well we could serve these areas and we or we should serve these areas but if you don't understand the cost of that you know you're only about 50 percent of the way there so as we were looking at cost estimates you know, we, we did look at, at retaining most of the service that's in the core, and the core to me is, is the number two, the number three, the number five, and the number one. So those are those routes that provide service in the core. We also went through and tried to reorganize some routes to try to blend a couple others together um, to, tr to provide the coverage without entirely new mileage. And the bottom line was that we were looking at an increase of about $1.1 million a year or about a third of the existing transit budget to provide the, the level of service that we're showing on the map here, which would include some crosstown routes between different transit centers. We did not go through and do any kind of a capital cost estimate of how many new buses, how many, what's the transit center going to cost. Um, that's, I think that's essentially that next step down the road that if you wanted to continue to look at it. And then the, the last element of the study that we were looking at was are there opportunities to make, um, pair, make the, the fixed route service more compatible, complementary to where um, the paratransit service wants to go? Um, or is presently going today or where paratransit riders are wanting to go. And what the map over here is showing is the origins and destinations for I think it was the month of April of this year of all of the paratransit rides that were provided. And that, that essentially you can see each of these lines represents an origin and a destination. Fatter lines um, reflect more frequency of, of the request or the schedule of that trip. And then if you look at it real quick, it's just a bunch of pickup sticks. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, 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 what, what we kind of determined based on looking at the origins and destinations was that about 20% of the, 
of the Parrot Transit trips are associated with either South Dakota Achieve or Dakota Abilities home places or workplaces or training places. Um, and that those are the ones that I've marked here in the, in the red squares and in the, uh, the yellow triangles. And the triangles are locations where there are either group homes or um, residential locations that had a lot of paratransit um, trips coming in and out of them. And, and then the red are, the, are the, uh, either the job training, the education, or one of the, 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 the uh, buildings for either South Dakota Achieve or Dakota Abilities. And that what we kind of can see from, from looking at this and, and the question we asked is, is it possible, like with the school tripper routes, is it, is it possible, is it reasonable to create essentially a Dakota Abilities South Dakota Achieve tripper? Because a lot of the, the trips that are being made are in the morning, you know, they're going to work, going to school like all of us, and then in the evening where you're going back home or or possibly even going from work to school or work to training. Um, so is it, is it feasible, reasonable to put together a, a, uh, a, a tripper service? And when you're thinking about the, the kinds of uh, the, the, the increment of trips we're talking about, you know, you are consistent with some of the, 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 uh, the number of trips that are, are being carried on a number of the routes today. So that we're in that, that ballpark of, you know, if we can, if, it, if it's reasonable to, um, to migrate some riders from paratransit to fixed route, we believe that those numbers are at least reasonable to continue to look at. Then the big question is, though, is, is are your riders or are they, do you have a population of riders that it is really reasonable to try to migrate? Are they ambulatory or are they, are they in a wheelchair? That if, if the folks are in a wheelchair, it's, it, you know, the, the, the um, capacity of, of the bus, the amount of time that it takes to, to get that person on the bus is, is quite a while. And, and you start to lose the efficiency of the fixed route service. And then you're, you're back to the whole purpose that you developed the paratransit service anyway. So, you know, it's, it's likely worthwhile to continue looking at the opportunities to find a population to try to migrate. It's going to require additional travel training, but when you're looking for, for grants for mobility management, you know, those grants are, are a little bit easier to find these days than they may have been five and ten years ago. So there might be ability to get some help there. Okay. Um, we also had... had as part of the study stopped and took a look at, well, how does Sioux Falls really stack up against other peers within similar operating communities relative to transit? Um, looking at some of the, the key measures of effectiveness, measures of efficiency in the, in the service. And I, I think what I want to do is make sure I start at the bottom here in our, our cost per revenue hour, our cost per revenue mile of service that we provide is very good. Um, that were well below on the cost per revenue hour, well below the average of, of the, I think it was five or six or seven peers that we were looking at. And our cost per revenue mile is, is also about 10% below the average of our peers. So from a, what does it cost us to put it out on, put transit service out on the street? You're operating a pretty efficient system. But then when we start to look at the efficiency on a per rider basis, then we start to see a little bit different of a picture um, in that when we're looking at the passengers per revenue mile, passengers per revenue hour, that Sioux Falls is below the average when it comes to the efficiency. And, and I, I guess then that kind of leads you to ask the questions of, well, why is it? Those questions are pretty hard to answer um, in a very concrete manner, um, but some of the, the the information that we want to make sure that we provide is that it's not the entire system that's operating essentially below the average for the peers. That this is the, the route productivity or the riders per revenue mile for each of the routes that we have in the system from the 1 to the 19, which are the regular and peak hour fixed route. And the ones that I'm showing in the, the orange or the gold are the, the school trippers. So we'll kind of set those aside as we're looking at efficiency. Um, but when you're looking at the remainder of the system and you can look at the core, 
the number three, the number four, the number five, the six, and the seven, that they're all operating above the average for the peers. It's just that we, there are some of the routes that, that are operating well below the average for the peers. So it's a system that's got some very good routes and some relatively poor routes. And, and that, I think, is it leads to the idea of we need to be looking at the entire system and it's probably time to go in and just shake the whole thing out and say what kinds of changes could we make, should we be making to try to improve that utilization. And this map here, which is about the last one, this map here I think does a very good job of characterizing um, the goods and the bads of the system. And what this is showing is, is where uh, people are getting on and getting off of each of the routes. Um, and one of the good examples, if you look on the north, you got the number eight there. Um, you can see that there are pockets at Benson, pockets at 60th, along both 4th Avenue and Cliff Avenue, where there are a reasonable amount of people getting on and off, but then there are relatively long stretches, especially on, say, 4th Avenue, between Benson and, and back down to the river, where there isn't a whole lot of activity. Segments like this is what is hurting the productivity. So that these are the, 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 the segments, these are the things that should be continued to look at to try to improve the efficiency, whereas if you look at the number, uh, number four that runs east and west along 10th, uh, 10th Street, uh, east of the downtown, is that there is just, there are no stretches along there where there isn't a whole lot of activity. Um, and that that was one of those routes that was operating very well. It's one of the highest producers within the region, whereas the number eight, if I go back to the other map, the number eight is, is it's marginal um, relative to, to the operations uh, compared to some of the others in the core. Okay. Um, but also to let you know here that if you look out at the number 10, the 11, and the 19, you're going, wow, nobody's riding those. Those weren't included within the sampling of the ons and the offs. So those we've, we've set aside for now, but um, on, on this map, and we wanted to make sure that we pointed that out and we did um, highlight them differently within the key there. Okay. Um, how to work on the productivity or some of those challenges that we have on the productivity is that when you're looking at the average uh, work trip within the region, it's about 12 minutes long. But then when you're looking at the average transit trip, trying to get a transit trip down to 12 minutes, that's, that's going to be a fight. When you're thinking of um, maybe 40 to 50 percent of the trips require a transfer, that you're already burning three, four, five, six minutes in that transfer, making that up in line hall. You know, the, 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 the per, we, we need to work on the frequency of service um, and relative to the, the person that's able to drive their, their own car. Um, and that, uh, and that, you know, looking at, at some of those areas where if we were to improve the, the frequency because we have the density, that maybe we could get a, a pretty good kicker in our ridership, which then also leads to less congestion, um, and gives everybody else the opportunity to have more uh, of the road for themselves. Um, uh, relative to the, the future actions, what we're suggesting is, uh, and I've kind of talked about this, that shakeout conduct an operations analysis of the existing routes uh, to look at what changes should be made to try to improve the efficiency, try to get rid of some of those pockets of, of low productivity. Um, and, and that, you know, annually, staff is already doing that, but it, it might be time to just to take an, a real good look at it and a, an in-depth look at it. Um, and that and then all of our conclusions are is we likely need more dollars to do something substantially different with the transit system. So let's start to look at uh, new sources of funding that are available to us through various grants um, and, and other opportunities. Um, and that the, the big thing I think is, is not just coming up with a, a plan of this is what we, we should do is make changes to these routes here and this route there and that route there but it's, it's going to require an implementation plan that, that we need to do over time because some of these changes we should be looking at are going to be connected to continued development on the outside of the donut. Okay, uh, that's kind of my, my presentation on the, the, the work that we've been doing. 
Are there any Good. questions? Thank you, Bill. Questions for Bill? Councilor Anderson. <clears throat> Guess I'll start it off. Can we go back to the map that was showing uh, Route 8? The ons and the offs, this one? Yes. Now, you show a lot of little stops up on that route, and we're talking about the efficiency of that. Right. What would be some of the things that you would do to try to improve efficiency on that route? I, I think on this route, and this was one of the locations where we had thought that, that having more of a, of a circulator on the north end that would come down to a, tr uh, a new transit center that then would provide that connection into downtown um, would improve some of the, the efficiency of that route. Um, also, I think on this route, it's, it's one of those where, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> I can draw over here and, and I'm going, wow, this is getting pretty messy. <laughs> um, that's one of those routes that has a very low frequency. So I, I think it's also um, t probably time to take, uh, take a little bit of time and look at it and ask the question of if we improve or increase the frequency on that route, is there an opportunity to provide a kicker in the efficiency and the, the uh, cost effectiveness of the route? Is it a situation where, well, geez, if I can only <clears throat> ride it every hour, you know, it, it, it's just too much of a risk. I can't get to work on time. I can't get home on time. If I, if I miss my stop, I have a very small window. So maybe that's also, because there are in that area some, some very high density employment opportunities. And that if we Im increase the frequency in that area, is, it, is there an opportunity to, to improve the overall cost effectiveness? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I may. And that's, I agree with you there, because to the east of that route, exactly. we have that other industrial area that has a yep. lot of banking in there, and you have two areas there of residential that the routes don't stop through those residentials right. or buy them either. And if you look at this map, it shows a completely reworked number eight, and what we've done here is, is kind of reworked the number eight and the number six so that the number eight becomes essentially a, a northern circulator and that it, it goes over and it to the, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the employment center off of uh, Benson Road there right off of the interstate is, but you, pardon? Well, yeah, city. And, that, and that we have, so that then we would provide service in and through that area where today there just isn't any and it's well outside of that quarter mile walk. Um, and that we had set up a, or, or identified a new transit center along cliff. Um, the, the challenge there is finding the right spot. Um, you know, is it on cliff? Is it on 4th Avenue? And there are probably some arguments both ways and, and just finding the right spot. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Bill? Councilor Rolfing. Uh, Bill. A couple of notes I took down. One, uh, first one is, um, when are we going to be large enough to do this? You kind of implied that we're not quite there yet. Is this the step before we end up taking this over ourselves at two hundred thousand? Um, you know, as we get we get to that point, we're going to end up with less federal funds, and we're going to have to be doing some of this ourselves. Um, are we, or are you saying this is something we should be looking at right now? Well, I think there are parts of this that probably should be looked at right now. I mean, are there opportunities to make changes to some of the routes, and does it make sense to make changes to some of the routes um, to improve? Well, I mean, we keep saying improve the ridership, but it essentially improve the cost effectiveness of the service. Right. And, and that's where I think the implementation plan comes in, is what should we be doing today? What should we be doing in, in say, three, or three to five years? What should we be doing in five to ten years? And what should we be putting off until, you know, like the, the discussion that there was on the, on the water, is that we understand we have 15 years of capacity left, and that certainly you're also looking at a density. Uh, when do we anticipate development of a certain density in an area that isn't served today? Um, and, uh, and that it, based on how far into the future that is, you kind of back yourself off that it's going to take us X years to, 
to figure out what to do, why years to get the money, um, and hopefully not too long to do the implementation. One more. Yes, go ahead. I'm intrigued also by your, and, and intrigued I guess would be a good, good word of the kind of what we see in, in larger cities of the, the park and ride idea. With the, the park, park and ride? Park and ride, yeah. um, uh, of taking it uh, from a southwest, uh, east, south southeast uh, corner and doing the express route in and then people could go from southeast to up to Sanford or up to Citibank yep. or one of those deals on the on the bus going back up to pick them up uh, I think that could be and because you wouldn't have to run it all day you'd run two or three of them in the morning and be done with it with express and routes like you said though as long as you could as long as you could make them steady and easy and you had enough time there enough of a window where people wouldn't get caught um, you could have a you could have a deal, and then I, I would imagine you could have businesses that would be very, very willing to share their parking lots for those, uh, you know, with um, with a, um, you know, a, a Starbucks coffee in them or something along those lines that but would uh, one, be one very of the, willing to help along those ways. A couple of the big challenges that we end up having is that when you you kind of squint at where those uh, more dense employment centers are in, in the city is that you have the Golden Triangle, you have downtown, you have the emerging stuff on the far northwest, and now you have you know, the Sanford development in the northeast, and, and those big employment centers are starting to get pretty dispersed. I bet if you look back 25 years, downtown was, was it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with that dispersion, the concept of park and ride um, especially if you try to take the shotgun approach to park and ride, we're going to do it everywhere, um, that it becomes much, much less efficient uh, because then you're going to be going, okay, where, because what you want to do is tie the park and ride at a convenient location between the origin and the destination. I don't want to have to drive 50% of my way to my destination of work, get on a park and ride, and then and then ride the last half, because in Sioux Falls, the last half is going to be six minutes, seven minutes. Um, yeah, so that, 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 that's our, our biggest challenge. One of our biggest challenges is the distribution or the more decentralization of employment centers, um, plus a lot of the locations where, where we're starting to get some pretty high uh, percentages of the population that are outside the service area. So to provide these par a park and ride that would actually be used, we're going to have to extend transit service to do that. And, and then that ends up you know, increasing the transit budget. But it's, so there are a few challenges to that. It's not an all-day service, so it's exactly. two or three buses yep. a, a day in the morning and two or three at night. And, and, and it's not Saturday service. It's not looking at Sunday service. So in reality, that when you're looking at it from a cost standpoint relative to a new all-day route, yeah, it's, it's considerably less money. Good. Thank you. Councillor Aguilar. Bill, you said that um, one of the solutions may be new transit centers. Um, how much is the average cost of a transit center, and did you estimate how many we would need to um, make it more efficient? Yeah, the average, I mean, the average cost, that's a tough one because a transit center could be a slab of concrete that three buses can park around with a couple of shelters. Um, a, a transit center could be the bus stop. I mean, the bus stop is a couple of million dollars. Um, Southwest Transit Center, you know, I, I would assume that, that what we'd be looking at and, 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 it, and with the transit center, you can look at it on a, on a um, over a period of time implementation basis so that you could start off with just um, a, a concrete parking area with some enhanced shelters. So there you could might maybe get by for $100,000, $150,000, really depending on how much concrete you got to build. Or it could be a situation where you put one at, at Empire Mall where you put out a few shelters um, and that the, the slab of concrete is already there so that that could be very cost, less costly. <laughs> and that, But looking at where the locations are, and they're shown on, on the map here, um, is that we were looking at, 
at, and, th and these were based on trying to intercept trips and, and keep routes to a certain length because there's only so much mileage you can cover in that 30 minutes we were looking at. So that one would be up off of uh, um, Russell on the, the, the northeast or the northwest. Another one would be off a cliff. Um, uh, I guess it would be south of, uh, just south of Benson. We'd be looking at a third in the southeast part of the town um, over in the vicinity of 41st and Sycamore. Um, and then that one is probably further out as, as that's, um, you know, there's more development that, occur, that can occur outside of that. So those were, I think we were looking at three new centers and those would be the locations. Go ahead. One more question. Not necessarily for you, but I guess uh, maybe for, for city staff, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. What is the recommendation as to where you think we should be going? Well, first of all, um, for you that are involved with the MPO, the Urbanized Development Commission, this study is going to go to them for an approval because there are, are funds involved um, with, the, with this project, so they'll hear it there and, and, and look to, for an approval of the study. After the case of the implementation, we're going to take the recommendations that um, the study has, and Bill has talked about a little bit already, in looking at how we can start to phase some of those in. What types of things can we do now without more needed budget? What types of things should we start to be looking at in terms of um, new routes? There are places, uh, as you probably are well aware of, that would love to have new, have transit service. Um, and we would have to start to prioritize based upon the plan here where we could start to phase that in. Now we kind of have a structure for that. Um, so that will be very helpful. Um, so it's a phased approach. And, and also looking at the, um, the productivity, how can we improve the product productivity? We'd have to start, and we would probably next year, start to look at some of our routes. How can we improve some of those routes that are improving, that aren't producing as well as they, uh, as they should? Thank you. Good. Other questions or comments for Bill or Sam? Councilor Jamison. I had heard this uh, abbreviated uh, presentation at our uh, UDC meeting, and it was certainly disappointing to know that the grid system isn't the way to go, because I think our goal back then was to look at a, a way to improve service, make it more efficient, get more riders to ride it. So certainly disappointing that that, that doesn't work. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of money on this service, and I don't know what our main mission really should be. Is it you look at the, uh, Sam, you probably know this, but you look at the statement of why we have it, really it's <clears throat> pretty broad. I mean, the last statement of it is to, to have a positive social and economic impact on the community so, so that all citizens can have a positive social and economic impact on the community. So if you start looking at providing new services to these development areas like the southeast that's growing dramatically, you know, but I would argue that a lot of those people over there would never ride the bus. And, but our objective is to provide a service to the whole community. And if we just lop off some of these sections of town that would, you know, like the south, which is south of interstate, uh, interstate is probably likely, 229, not likely to ride a bus, but should we still be providing a service to them? I'm just struggling out loud here, frankly, as all to uh, figure out the best way to move forward in this thing well obviously there is a you know a few few reasons that you do it and we of course even have the paratransit service which is another reason uh, and I think a, a big portion of what you know even Bill mentioned is what's important is looking at those options for where, where it is the density is uh, where your best opportunities are going to be so that's what we're really looking for in terms of residential and employment density um, and the same thing kind of goes on, on even our existing routes. Is there some opportunities that we can be start to looking for? Um, were there some other opportunities to improve those existing routes? Because uh, we think the services is, is, is invaluable, but uh, yeah, we want to make sure we get the biggest bang for the buck. Councillor Entman. There's no doubt that <coughs> Councillor Jamison's comments about 
marketing and being able to get out and educate the people even becomes more important with this than before because quite honestly I, I believe it is a convenience aspect too for those of us that live in the far southeast part of town and have to travel completely opposite end of town and if it only takes 20 minutes to do so at the height of uh, the the traffic congestion that we have in this town it would seem to me that there really isn't much of an advantage to uh, to public transportation uh, I do believe that there is a need for it though don't get me wrong Sam but it has to really show that there's a convenience need uh, to be able to do that and I mean from 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 a work scheduling time to a travel amount of time that it takes a transferring time if it only takes me 20 minutes where if I were to arrive public transit and have to take and switch a bus once or twice and it you know makes it three quarters of an hour to an hour it just doesn't make sense for me it becomes unproductive time well I think that again that's why you know Bill was showing some of the opportunities we might have already within our existing system to look at higher frequency because if you start to do that all of a sudden now you're looking at you know every 15 minutes and now your your wait time is is, is much less and now your your the time that you're talking about your travel time between the car and the bus is much less and yeah that's yeah. It's challenging. Changing. I think there, there's a lot of work here, and there is no one answer. That's the, that's the. Uh... If I could add one thing about when, when we're talking about, um, you know, there, there's a technical aspect of this when we're looking at density and the travel time and the wait time and all of those things. But as you're also going through and, and asking yourself the question, is it a good idea? to change a route? Is it a good idea to extend service? Is it a good idea to add frequency? There has to be that, that public engagement element of it, asking the question of, well, would you use the service? And spending a considerable amount of time asking questions to the, to the potential new market of where is your origin and your destination? Um, you know, when do you work? Things like that that could help narrow down and and add credence to the to the math that goes into the back end of how much time is it going to take how many transfers are going to be required how much time is the transfer going to be so there has to be that that huge element of of understanding uh, the clientele other questions or comments Council will remember that uh, it's been a year ago that we asked for this study and we really were at a point where the routes were being changed and we didn't necessarily understand why. We wanted to make sure that our service was what it needed to be, but Councillor Rolfing it, it, it alluded to the idea that eventually we are going to run this on our own without federal dollars and so we're also looking at sort of efficiencies. So I guess I would ask, you know, it's going to UDC and, and the MPO groups and all of that, but um, that we be you know, continue to be part of this conversation that um, we certainly hear from constituents on a regular basis, you know, regarding accessibility and speed and efficiency and those kinds of things. So appreciate the report. Thank you so much for all of your work, Bill, and your staff, I know. And uh, thank you, Sam, for bringing it forward. And let's keep after it. Thank you. This meeting will be followed by the fiscal committee meeting in about 10 minutes. Is there anything else for this group? I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you.